What's your best time of writing? Morning? Afternoon? Late afternoon? Well, I like to be in morning when I'm writing. <laughs> it suits my topics. <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> Good question. Joining us today, Gore Vidal. Gore, we're in the hills of Hollywood. Thank you for having us. Well, that's a curious verb, but anyway, you are here. <laughs> and you obviously had a treat in driving through these beautiful hills. Indeed. There's ugly architecture everywhere you look. It's rather miraculous. There isn't a good-looking house anywhere along here. People in real estate trying to sell their gorgeous homes. They only have homes here. They don't have houses. But they have homes. And it's so wonderful. And everybody doesn't know his neighbor, which is wonderful. To have achieved that is no wonder Obama's having a difficult time with community as part of his little menu for the United States. We must communize a bit. No, he's not a communist. He's not a communist. He's a socialist. Well, he's not much of a social climber. Now, there are two social climbers <laughs> he threw out when they went to his party for the Prime Minister of India. Ah. They became stars, and I, he went under a cloud for a little time, you know. What's wrong with him? We all want to have uh, social climbers in our houses. That's why we have houses. Maybe we don't want them in our homes. Right. So important. Right. <laughs> Am I saying enough stupid things? You oh, think? Gore, come no, on. Gore. You could never say enough stupid things. Good. No, no you, please. That's a challenge. Please. You know, you, you, then, you, then you would have nobody to defend yourself against. Mm -hmm. I, I, are you reading any new authors that uh, no. tickle your fancy? No. 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 What are you reading as of late? As of late, I am reading um, as a marvelous historian of the early days of the Republic. He's published a new book called The Empire of Liberty, which is a quotation from Thomas Jefferson. Mm -hmm. Rather optimistic, I would have thought. What we are is an empire of blood and steel, just like Bismarck. We're an empire of power. But he said this way back at the time of the Louisiana Purchase. He didn't expect the place to go the way it did. But you're in the hills. You've made it to the top. <laughs> What's left after that, right? In these days of hyper-reality, where everyone is a star. Everyone yeah. is. Except the stars, you know, they're rather amateurish generally, but... What about, what about you know, the thing that's so uh, interesting in, in these current days is the, uh, the moral fiber of the country and the sex scandals and how they must laugh at us in Europe, you know, every celebrity who has... Well, they've always laughed at us. Yeah. First of all, we're the least educated in the real sense of the word of any first world country. No one here knows anything, particularly American history. Do you think I have enjoyed 50 years of writing American history? It was duty. Somebody had to do it. And I figured out I was one of the few people brought up in the middle of American history of my time. And so on and so forth. Oh, somebody sent me that. Would you like to look at my great-grandfather? Sure. In the Civil War. That's why the South <laughs> produces great tragedies, because we were well and truly beaten. I wonder what Jefferson would have thought 
Jefferson was so ambiguous, you know, you're never quite sure where you are with him. And he, because he was never sure what he was doing. Is he uh, preaching life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness? That was the newest thought in the world of constitution making, in the world of empire building. That that would be important. It, it meant the average person must be important. There's nobody who was ever born that we know of who did not want to pursue in one way or another happiness, mm. which made our Constitution unique, which is why the Europeans at least pretended to love it in the 1840s, 50s, 60s, by which time we were engaged in the Civil War, which turned everybody off, mm. except one person, Chancellor Bismarck of Germany. He sent observers over to look, study the, our civil war, which he then enacted in order to break the back of France, mm. which he proceeded to do. And I often talked about it. He said, oh, American Civil War. First submarines, he said, first submarines. Mm. Good idea, good idea. I had them. And then Fritzy, I told Fritzy about those long cannons. They were extraordinary. What was it uh, in, what was your calling to history as a young man? Was it your grandfather's life? Well, of course life? it was my grandfather. My grandfather made Wilson president twice, 1912, 1916. Came to loathe them both times. And the second time it was just folk demure. There wasn't anything else he could do. Then my grandfather's first, he was blind from the age of 10. Right. And he, uh, made a really roar, roaring speech because uh, after William Jennings Bryan, he was considered the greatest speaker in the U.S. of A. So he got out there and gave a, you know, wave, wave the bloody shirt they used to call it. You know, he spoke for the Confederacy. He spoke for the North. He spoke for everybody. Thunderous speech. To an absolute, his first audience was absolutely dead. And he'd end it, he thought, because he was a born, he was an atheist, like the, all the rest of us. Born atheist, and very proud of it. But he couldn't let Oklahomans know that, or he wouldn't go to the Senate so regularly. So he comes out with that. And he said, he decided, you know, he was in this area, he thought he'd do some Jesus Christ stuff. So he said, as certain as Jesus Christ is our Lord, we will win in November, and we will win again. And dead silence. And somebody said, oh, okay, Senator, that's it. He said, what do you mean, that's it? And he's waiting, he's used to applause that goes on. <laughs> and they were taking him out. He told the story on himself. As they were taking him out. He said, didn't anybody tell you, Senator, that was a synagogue in Los Angeles? <laughs> Here he was, guilty of Jesus Christ only once, and he did it in a synagogue. <laughs> when you were uh, developing your craft as a writer, your early works. Around the house, we call it art. Art, okay. It's a we'll shorter word. Thanks. Thanks, Gore. Yeah. Uh, your early work, a work like Messiah. Mm -hmm. what, what was the, what was it about Messiah, that story that resonated? Was it the TV evangelism that was being born of the day that you were reacting to? I was very curious about what was the mood of the country. I spent three years in the Army, mostly in the Pacific. I never heard a patriotic word from the bravest generation, the greatest generation. We may have been great, but it's what our tolerance for mm -hmm. nonsense was pretty great too. And we heard nothing from our leaders except the great Roosevelt. This generation of Americans has a rendezvous with destiny. That was the greatest of them all. 
I mean, insincerity enveloped him like a nimbus. <laughs> you can shoot a nimbus all around me. It'll, it'll accustom the audience. <laughs> and how about Churchill? Oh, a phony. Churchill did not know. How could he? Because he, he never stopped talking, you know, like me. And Churchill thought he had a friend in Roosevelt. Mm. It's interesting to say Churchill was a consummate British politician. Never understood emperors. It had no experience with them. Disraeli had made Victoria Empress of India, but only her immediate dressmaker had any knowledge of that. They put her up in a lot of Texas and sent her out to hard stations in the mm. world. So, what Churchill didn't understand was Roosevelt was an old Dutchman from the New Amsterdam, and they were all anti-British mm. and did not like New York, but they liked New Amsterdam. This was beyond Churchill. I mean, he couldn't figure out anything that wasn't, you know, graven on some monument that we'd, he had made a speech over. Well, from the beginning, Roosevelt, the first thing he did, which was a giveaway, and came as a great shock to Churchill, 45, Hitler is almost gone, and Japan is asking for peace and, and surrender. Right. American history books don't teach this because we blew up those two cities mm. to show our might. Mm. And we saved a million lives. American lives were saved. Right. We had already defeated Japan. Harry Truman, who should never have been you know, president of more than anything but a shoe company, was uh, president of the United States, and he didn't know anything either. Dean Acheson, his secretary of state, was a brilliant man, I'm sure. Michael Butler here knew him. We all did. I had, uh, I was the tallest boy in the dancing class at Mrs. Shippen. <laughs> and his, and Acheson's, Mary Acheson was the tallest girl. I danced with her any moment that I could take from peace. Mm. There would be the two of us stumbling around, being that, brought up in a Confederate uh, family <laughs> as I was. One of the reasons the South produced so many great writers in our time, we had lived through tragedy. Mm. Whole villages, our village was burned down, our, everything was stolen and uh, taken away. We thought the Yankees had overdone it, but there's nothing like losing a great war in which you made every effort to win. I think there's no doubt we were the better soldiers, but thank God the brains were in with, us, with the North and with Lincoln. I, I made a little joke about, somebody asked me on television, I was in New York a few months ago, and uh, you know, what is your, what are you most proud of that you've done, Mr. Vidal? And I said, well, that I never killed anybody despite a lot of provocation. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, she got it. She was very bright. <laughs> I was sitting in here and the doorbell rang. I just got back from New York. Two members of the Secret Service arrived at my door. Mm. We have a report, sir, that you said that you wanted to murder President Bush. <laughs> well, I said he isn't president now, so I think he, he would be safe now, isn't he? <laughs> well, that's not the way she told I said, this is why you've come at great expense to their beautiful suits. My aide here, my, my uh, naval attaché, as I call Fabian. <laughs> naval attaché. Well, he's, he's a lieutenant in the United States Navy to this day. He's still Fantastic. 
and he's a real Annapolis guy, and he's a real naval man. Right. He said to me, he said, watch out for the second one. <laughs> there were two guys. One was, a, you know, a J. Edgar Hoover special. <laughs> Beautiful blonde hair, cropped clothes. The other one was you know, more ordinary looking. I said, what's wrong with the second one? And Fabian was put in charge of a town in, in northern Hokkaido, where he used to spend a couple of very happy years before he came back. Mm -hmm. And he said, watch out for him, he's Korean. <laughs> <laughs> I am sitting in my house in the Hollywood Hills, and a Korean member of the Secret Service is warning me not to make jokes like that again. <laughs> We, uh, last time we met, we, would, we talked about uh, educating our young, and you felt the real heroes of America were the school teachers. You still feel that way? Magari, as we say in Italy, which would that it were so, yeah. Right. Have you met any recently? I know that on occasion you do. Uh, I do, Ethan, yeah. But the best, of course, are university teachers. And, right. uh, even they get, you know, totally frozen in their ways. And, what happens is they want to be poets, playwrights, novelists. Then they settle for a job because they get married too soon and they have children and so on. And they end up uh, in universities. Then they start to think of themselves, what drove me crazy for a while when I got very anti-academic. University academics, they, they thought they were intellectuals. I mean, none of them had ever read a book voluntarily. <laughs> Unless they saw tenure at the end of it, you know. <laughs> you have tenure, I'll, I'll, I'll afford it. No tenure, I. <laughs> but no, with the internet and everything, Gore, I mean, everyone has an opinion, everyone has a blog. The, the, where can you even find the truth today? Where do you find the truth? Well, don't look, and then you'll be quite happy. <laughs> Everyone's opinion matters, and yet nothing makes any sense. Well, look, there's a con game called democracy. The United States has never tried democracy politically, and it has no shows, no sign of ever doing that. But they can't stop babbling it. The greatest democracy in the history of the world, well, that, so far as I know, is India. It's certainly not this really? can of worms, no. What's democratic here? How about a parliamentary system where we have uh, more party options? Well, the Brits have a better system than we do, but that's about it. I mean, we don't go around the world looking at other places because we know we're perfect. Try and say that in a school or a high school. The British system is better than the American system. You will be attacked. And how, how would you rank our rate our current administration. Well, our current health care plan, what did you think of the... the well, I thought it was, uh, look, it's, it is a scandal of the world, our health system. And uh, these fat-ass senators got it. Wow, we've got the greatest health care in the entire world. Yeah, the la uh, when did you see a Norwegian coming here with a green card just for the health care? Come on. We're a joke. But since most of America is a joke, particularly in its pretensions, only a, a lonely voice like mine is occasionally heard. And even then, it causes hysteria. They have to be lied to. And they're always ready with a lie to answer you. And your appearances on Bill Maher, do you enjoy those? Well, I wouldn't do it if I didn't. <laughs> True. I, I, I find his voice very refreshing. How do you... Uh, oh, I like him. Yeah. How about John Stewart? Are you a fan of his... Uh, yes, I like him. Yeah. A little bit goes a long way, and uh, he has a, a tendency to cuteness. And if he's listening to this, rectify it, John. <laughs> If you notice, <laughs> if you notice, I included the H that he drops ah. in the John. 
How about uh, Christopher Hitchens? Do you enjoy his writing? No. No? But then I don't read him. Ah. I'm not one of those old writers who rushes down to the dock to see what's arrived. <laughs> I don't give a damn. What's your best time of writing? Morning? Afternoon? Late afternoon? Well, I like to be in mourning when I'm writing. <laughs> it suits my topics. <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> Good question. So what, what, are, what are our grades for Mr. Obama right now? B minus. What's B minus and what are we going to rank besides trying at least to reform the health care? Are you in favor of his position in Afghanistan? Of course not. Is that a winnable thing, in your opinion? No, it's well and truly lost already. Right. Every military man knew that. I wish he had been a bit more a man of our time, which meant that he might have spent some time in the army, mm. the military, then he wouldn't be so overwhelmed by generals, most of whom really you wouldn't put in charge of a shoe shop, you know. And, uh, you know how I kept track of what was going on in the Pentagon was every time Bush wanted to start a new war, there'd be a new general with a new star twinkling. You see, not having an educational system, and not even knowing what education is, you end up with the blind. So they're sleepwalk. Well, there you have it. From the hills of Hollywood. Gore, thank you. Yeah. As always, dull and boring. Thank you for your questions, always. Boring and dull. <laughs> <laughs>